This is a test. This station was conducting a test of the emergency broadcast system. This is only a test. <laughs> This concludes this test of the emergency broadcast system. Right, cool. Um, where are you? It looks like you're in the shed. You in yeah, I basically am. Yeah. Are you in your living room or are you in the shed? <laughs> no, I'm at, I'm at my folks' house. Oh, okay. Um, because uh, I live in LA, so I'm I'm uh, over here in the UK at the moment, um, touring. And I didn't, uh, I didn't uh, know you. I didn't know you were in LA. I know. You, I know your your missus is American. That sounds really creepy. That I know that. <laughs> um, mm. How long have you been living in the states? Twelve years now. All oh, right. Okay. What made you move there? Um, there's many things really, uh, but ma- mainly it boils down to just adventure. You know, it's that's all it was. Right. That's all it was. So we uh, we just uh, up sticks, uh, three kids. Uh, a dog and a studio, and off we went. <laughs> oh, nice! You're a Hammers fan, aren't you? I am. Yes. What? Because because you're from Windsor. What led you to the Hammers? Well, funny enough, my dad was a uh, um, a QPR fan, um, but he never really took us. He never took me and Jody to my brother uh, Jody to football, and um, uh, you know he's not like a proper football fan, if you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and. Uh, my, we have uh, family friends who were um, uh, season ticket holders at Upton Park, and this would have been early 80s. Um, and uh, he took Jody and I to, uh, um, yeah, what was the first game we went to? It was Spurs away, and uh, we lost 5 0. <laughs> and I just remember the, the West Ham fans doing the okie cokey up and down the aisle, and I was like, yep, these are my people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, I, I say because I I live in Leighton, so I live out east, and um, yeah, my, my, I'm from Yorkshire, so my team's Doncaster Rovers. But I I, I am a uh, I don't know what you would call it. I'm a, sort of like one of those people who has two teams, basically the worst people alive. And, <laughs> and I, I do go watch Leighton Orient a fair bit. Uh, and yeah. I'm, I'm actually going this afternoon, and uh, oh, great. Or, Orient uh, passionately hates West Ham, which oh uh, yeah, yeah, I imagine is a hatred which is. Not reciprocated because who cares? Not, not really. No, it's similar with uh, with Millwall. Millwall hate us as well. But I mean, <laughs> I mean, we have a bit more of a of a history with Millwall than we do than uh, Leighton Orient. But yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, uh, it's it's a kind of a weird thing, isn't it? Um, but yeah, I imagine it to a West Ham fan, it feels a little bit like a I don't know, like a fly buzzing around your face. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Who I guess cares? so. Oh, nothing against Leighton Orient. Jeez, why not? No, uh, local exactly. team. Isn't it? You know. Do you get so many games with living away? Uh, well, it's tough. Obviously, when I'm in the states, I can't. Uh, but when I'm when I'm over here touring or whatever, and I've got I've got that day off, yeah, I'm, I go ho- home and away. Uh, you know, whenever I can. Um, I love it. I absolutely love it. But uh, you know, it's tough. It's tough um, sometimes to get there. Just uh, you know, and I'm, I end up being an armchair supporter. But uh, <laughs> but I've been to you know a lot of games over the last few years for sure. Uh, Amazing. And, you know, Amazing. Uh, so I've been listening to your new record this morning, um, and to, to my new one, yeah, the the one that's not out yet, yeah. So J- J- James James sent you, um, yeah, that's what journalists get to do. <laughs> get right, to, right. Get, well, is that a surprise to you? Yeah, because no, nobody's heard that record. <laughs> well, I feel very honoured. Yeah, uh, I guess so. Yeah, yeah. No, well, I was. You know, I had a pretty kind of set idea of what I wanted to talk to you about, and then he just he just dropped that record in my inbox uh, last night. So right. I got up, I got up a bit early and spent a bit of time with it. And I think there's I, there's some songs in there I really like. I should probably do like a little. I should probably clear my throat slightly, really, just and sort of explain a little bit about what my relationship to your music is. So mm. 
you know, I'm 43. So like when I was a kid, you know, the one only comes out, I go see Buddy's song. Like, you know, you were, you were a pop star, you know, the girls, yeah. had, the girls had posters of you on, on the girls had posters of you on my, um, oh, not on my wall, on their wall. Uh, and, <laughs> and, um, but I always sort of, you know, I'm a big fan of like power pop, I guess, for want of a better term. You know, I, yeah. love, Fount- I love Fountains of Wayne. So, you know, oh, when I was a- mate, I could, I could tell you a lot about Fountains of Wayne. I, I used to write with Adam. Adam was we, an, old, an old mate of mine. We were at, we will absolutely get there. So it was almost like I sort of had a bit of a second wind with your music. Yeah. Because of Fountains of Wayne. You know, I was like, yeah. and, and then that made me see your music in a slightly different way because... I realised that a lot of what you'd done, that the, there was all this sort of, I don't know, sort of like chunky guitar pop music that is very much in, in the lineage of the of the music I really like that yeah. I wasn't aware of, you know, because you were just the one and only guy, right? You yeah, know, you exactly. were the guy. So, but let me let me let me save them. Let me save some of that stuff for the back end because I want to ask you about this new record because the thing that really floored me is. It feels really personal to yeah, the ex- to the extent that there were moments where I was like, "Is this guy okay?" And I wanted to ask <laughs> if you were okay, and also I wondered how auto- autobiographical it was. Um, yeah, those two really. Yeah, it does feel really personal. No, it is. Um, it is very personal and it, all autobiographical. Um, and songs, obviously, you're you're probably referencing some of the songs that uh, you know feel like like cathartic, had to be written uh, lyrics. Um, so yeah, it, it, they really were. There are some, as as you know, as you've heard the album, um, you know, kick the doors down, uh, pop bangers on there. Um, you know, some that I'd uh, written with uh, with Jake Gosling, some I'd written with Nick Kershaw, um, and. Uh, you know, some on my own, but like, uh, yeah, there are some, there are some subjects on there, uh, on that record that, um, very, very, very close to my heart and, uh, and, and stuff that, you know, I'm kind of only, only just now kind of like dealing with, you know what I mean? From, uh, from trauma stuff that's happened in, uh, you know, in, uh, over the years, um, that I've never really kind of dealt with. And, you know, for me, it's kind of like my form of therapy. You know songwriting and uh i don't know why it's all coming out now but uh you know uh, it's, it's made me feel better <laughs> has it mm-hmm. well it's i guess helped. there's yeah i guess there's that thing and this is what i mean i did two episodes of the podcast last week it was so weird how they how this, this subject matter arose twice in the same week but i did two episodes last week uh with musicians who'd written records about miscarriage and it was it mm. was like you know, I stumbled through it trying to be empathetic, and I'm I'm terrible with this stuff. I'm always the person <laughs> that says something completely inappropriate because I feel <laughs> awkward. Yeah. So I feel a bit. I feel a bit like that's where I'm at actually. And also, when I said I'd heard the record, and I might be reading too much into this, you you did have a faint look of terror in your face. I did. Yeah, because I haven't really spoken about it yet, and because yeah, you know, I haven't braced myself for that uh, because. You know, record's not out, um, and I, I knew this. I knew this was coming. You know, and I, I realized that you know, good journalists and people that actually listen to the record are going to be like, "Hang on a minute, <laughs> there's more to this than meets the eye." Um, and uh, uh, you know, I haven't, I haven't discussed uh, a lot of the the subjects uh, matter, the subject matters uh, that that the you know that the songs are all about. You know, so yeah, that you you did you. You saw that correctly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, if it makes you feel, well, I don't know, I make you feel, you'd have to be a sociopath to answer it, it makes you feel better. But I've just written a book about, uh, which is in the pipeline to be out next year. And mm-hmm. a lot of that's about childhood experiences. And mm. on one hand, you're kind of excited that there's going to be a book out there with your name on it. But on the other hand, you're like, I think I'm going to have to end up talking about this over and over and over again. And I'm a bit yeah. worried about that. So this song 13. It, did that happen to you? Yes. Yeah, I did, yeah. Jesus Christ. Yeah. When did you... When... And again, this is where I'm going to stumble, right? But I'm going to do my best, so forgive me if I stumble. When When did that go from, hey, I'm a young guy and this is a cool thing, to 
Mm. Oh my God, I can't believe that happened to me. Uh, I never had that. I'm a young guy and this is a cool thing uh, because she was not, uh, you know, your typical Swedish au pair. (laughs) (laughs) She, she was, um, she was uh, she she was more like Dolph Lundgren than uh, Britt Eklund, <laughs> put it that way. Right. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, as a thirteen-year-old boy, that was not cool. Um, yeah. Was that because there, there seems to be something in the song where you're almost pleading for with almost kind of other adults that they didn't see. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's basically what what the song was written about. Um, it wasn't particularly about about the the incidents themselves, uh, although I do kind of get into it a little bit in the lyric. But it was really about not being seen. Yeah, um, because you know, bless the people around me. Uh, they, I guess, it was just a, a pre a preoccupation with with life and everything else that's going around um and although i you know i have memories of saying stuff um uh, you know maybe i didn't really express it um but i was only 13 so yeah yeah uh, you don't really know how to and you're a little bit scared about it all and it's a little bit uh, you know you're, you're kind of nervous to, to to say anyone and you know it's it's it's, it's a strange feeling um and i look back on that now and you know, I had I had definitely, you know, a dark period as at that age, thinking that I was on my own. Uh, you know, dealing with it, and you know, and I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that that can probably relate to this if they've been through uh, anything like this, you know, any kind of sexual abuse, you know. So, uh, yeah, the song. The, <laughs> I don't know why it came out. You know, as I'm as I was approaching my fifties, um, but it, that is one of the subjects that that has kind of like I guess followed me round in a way. You know, and uh, I, I'd never really kind of I look at it like like you've got this kind of uh, dusty old pebble, you know, sitting in the corner of the room, and you see it now and again, and you just kind of like turn away from it and. I'll just leave that for now. It's gathering cobwebs over the years and it just gets worse and worse and worse, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. And um and then, you know, when you do eventually pick it up, it's because of someone else normally. It's because you're speaking to someone that you love and mine happened to be my wife. Um and you know, she's like, Well, I think you need to pick that thing up and, you know, give it a good polish and get rid of all the dirt and and the cobwebs and and have a good look at it. As much as as painful as it might be, yeah, um, that's the only way you're going to move forward. I think. Uh, there's so, all, do you think there's something as well about this? I don't know about this. I mean, you know, you're saying that you don't don't know why this. You don't know why you chose to look at that pebble or clean that pebble. I'm going to continue your analogy there. Um, you, you don't know why you did it as you were approaching fifty, but is there something a bit about this moment where it feels a little bit like? we're all kind of allowed to do that in a way that we maybe weren't 10 years ago. Uh, yeah. You're talking about kind of like the zeitgeist of, of, uh, yeah, well, this this is a bit of a reckoning of how you do this stuff. I think you're right. It's a good word for it. That's a good word for it. Um, yeah, we're, there's definitely less stigma attached to, uh, therapy or, you know, talking about emotions, especially for men. Here's the thing. Suicide in men uh, of our age is at an all time high. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's mainly because we don't talk, you know, and we don't talk to each other and we don't, you know, it's just not a manly thing to do in, in, in historically, is it, you know, but, um, yeah, it is, it is the only way you really get to move forward from these things. Uh, otherwise they're just kind of like, you know, it's like putting a, putting a lid on a jar and just, shoving it down and it just festers inside you and um you you are right there it does seem to be a little bit of a reckoning to uh to that way of thinking our, our kind of you know parents and grandparents uh, uh way of thinking where you just say you know buck up your ideas son and just get on with it you know that type of thing um when you know talking about these things uh and burying your soul crying <laughs> men crying you know 
Yeah. It's okay. In fact, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. <laughs> and it's I'm not one of these kind of like, you know, woke guys that, uh, but it depends what how you how you uh, define woke these days isn't it but uh but uh, definitely in in this sort of um yeah in the how would i describe this in the kind of the if, if we're taking woke as this kind of deconstruction of everything that makes the world tick and you know this over kind of um yeah this this obsession with the set with with the self then i am very much not a woke guy no. you know yeah. what i mean yeah. I obviously don't mean it in the sense of um, shall we get rid of racism and sexism and such like, but in the kind of let's make the world, um, let's shave all the hard edges off. I'm, I'm not that person. So feel free yeah. to uh, be as free with your criticisms of this stuff as you want to be. Yeah. No, no I, 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 yeah, sorry, I saw, um, I was, was watching uh, Ricky Gervais's uh, uh, Armageddon the other, the other night. And yeah. he, he summed it up really well. The, the, the whole woke, Thing. and it's like if it's if it's about um you know uh anti racism and anti you know anti misogynist and and uh and anti anti sexism and, and all this kind of stuff then you know yeah of course you know uh, i'm all for it but if it means that you don't you're not able to actually you know have, make a joke or uh, if you're not able to uh give your own opinion without getting cancelled <laughs> then um you know that, that kind of overcompensation, as you put it, there. You know, like the, where the needle goes like so far over, yeah. Uh, where you're just scared to say anything in the end. <laughs> then, yeah, then I, and I think I'm that's terrible. That. I think that's terrible for art. You know, and oh, that's, totally. That's terrible. kind of normally where I come from. It, you know, yeah. normally. But I think that um, it's interesting you say that because I guess there's a bit of a thing with. Um, you know, like I, I, I've you know literally written a book about you know my childhood quote unquote trauma, right? So I'm mm -hmm. definitely of the school that men, uh, men need to talk or they need to or, or anyone, you know, regardless of their sex, they this stuff is better out than in in lots of ways. But I, I am probably a bit, I'm quite a subscriber to the sort of stoic viewpoint as well that like if you always let kind of trauma define you, then it will take control and there is a degree of that's true. You know, I quite like I quite like going to football sometimes and not talking about what happened to me as a kid. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> yeah. Totally. You want to be a man, just want to be a bloke. Yeah. There's that balance, isn't there? Yeah. Oh but, completely. Yeah. But you said yeah. that th when I said to you this is very personal. <laughs> and I also sort of, you know, threw in the moment in there. But I wondered whether I wondered whether there was something about and this maybe ties into sort of your career journey where there was also just something where you felt like you could totally be yourself at this point, that you could show the mm. world who you were rather than this. Because, you know, look, the elephant in the room, right, is that, you know, a lot of your career has been defined by a song. Yeah. And, like, I, I have watched interviews with you or read interviews with you over the years where at various points you've been irritated by that or stressed by that or mm. comfortable with that like it's yeah i do i do i do fluctuate on it where, where uh, are you at the moment um i'm still fluctuating <laughs> you know because <laughs> yeah. the truth is um i i do realize that you know most people will only know me for that song and that is a little irritating uh because you know obviously there's more to to me than that song. I'm a 52 year old bloke, and I've had a life and experiences and stuff. And you know, I'm a musician, I'm a songwriter, and everything else. Um, and it is, it is kind of frustrating to be, um, you know, superficially um, identified and defined by a six month period of your life when you were 19. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that's kind yeah. of. You know, that's kind of how I look at it. And like when people, when I meet people that literally, you can tell that that's all they think I am. You know, sometimes I do um, I, these acoustic gigs where um, where I've got a, a crowd of people that have come to see me or or the, a lot of the blokes have been dragged along by their wives or whatever, you know. And uh, I'll, I'll do a little bit of the one and only at the beginning and, I'm, and then uh, I just kind of stop and I'm like, all right, that's all I got as a bit of a joke, you know. <laughs> 
Yeah. And um, thanks very much. Good night. And uh, and then I say, okay, all right, hands up who thought that, that really was all the only thing I've ever put out and, the, you know, the only song I've ever sung. And and I literally, it's I'm, I'm amazed at how many people put their hands up, <laughs> you know. Really? So, yeah. So you think that when I was, you know, 18, 19, I decided to, to create one song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I thought, and, and it was a big hit. And then... And then from there on, uh, I just thought, nah, ah, not music's not for me. I'll go and I'll do something else now. <laughs> Why do you think it played out like it did? Well, I think there's a lot to be said for, uh, you know, the song itself. Like the, you know, the fact that it's called the one and only <laughs> didn't yeah. help that narrative. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and and I can I can see that there's a there's a a quite kind of a fuzzy love for the for the song and my connection to it and i think people love the idea <laughs> if you know what i mean of well, me being you, a one hit wonder oh right okay right uh, they love the idea of that connection that like oh chesney chesney the one and only the you know, one and only chesney you know <laughs> right. and and they can't a lot of people can't see past that but then you know when they hear music like you've just heard this record or, or if they've seen me live and i you know obviously a, there's more, I do other songs, <laughs> obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, I I can't tell you the amount of times I've had people come up to me. So you know what? I came along. Uh, my wife dragged me, and uh, I thought it was gonna. I I, I thought it was just gonna be shit. You know, my friend said, "What's he gonna do? The one and only thirteen times." Yeah. Um. And uh, sorry, I did that in a northern accent. That was no. Really it, was, it was it was fine. <laughs> it reminded me of my of my uh, formative days. So I appreciate. It. <laughs> You know, and then they're like, uh, "But you know what? You're all right." <laughs> like, oh, thanks, mate. No, yeah. I, I'll take that. Uh, you know, it's like double-edged sword going on there. Yeah, but, uh, I do get yeah. that a lot. But I feel, I feel like be... should, I feel like there should be something on the posters to your gigs that are like the other songs are good too. You know, what I, mean? <laughs> That's good. I might can, use that. Joke. Yeah, you can have, you can have that. I I wonder though whether also well, I guess that you know again look. Forgive me if at any point this feels rude, because I've already told you your new record's really good. So I feel like that was my sort of what at what point did you think maybe that maybe another hit's not coming? Because to have like your first single go to number one, five weeks, you know, so on. Yeah. Like at what point did you think, oh, this isn't going like I maybe expected it to? Well, I mean, obviously I had uh, a, a huge wake up call. Um, after that time, uh, you know, where when the second single, you know, was just about scraped the top 20 and then second single was like, you know, just scraped the top 40 and then they dropped me, you know, right. pretty much, yeah. pretty much. Yeah. I did. I did make another album uh, for that record label, but they never put it out. Right. Um, so that was kind of the, the big wake up call, like, oh. Because before that, you know, I had supreme confidence, and and of course, uh, uh, as a as a young youth, as a youth would have, you know, I I always knew. Uh, I mean, I was precocious as a teenager. I always knew I was going to make it. It's just one of those, you know. I I look back to the way I used to think, you know, as a yeah. kid, like there was no option. You know what I mean? There was no way on earth I wasn't going to make it. It yeah. was just what I was. I was so tenacious. I still ha have that a little bit, but it has been knocked over the years, obviously. So I, I think when that happened, that what you were just saying there, that kind of realization that oh, uh, that life isn't just a silver spoon, um, was was when the record label um, dropped me, and right. uh, you know, and I realized that I didn't. Not only was I not going to be having hits in the future. Yeah, well, in the, in the near future, because um, I never gave up. But but I wasn't, I didn't have the ability to put records out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that was like, it was like a mountain to climb, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I mean, there was a good, what, sort of 15-year period between the young release record and when you make another fine mess. It's about that, isn't it? It's about 15. Uh, it's yes. Yeah, I guess maybe 12, I think, uh, 2005, I put, I put it, uh, uh, that record out. And so the last, the last album before that was, uh, 93, I think. So, yeah. So was that, was that, so, well, I guess that begs the question, what we, what were you doing throughout that time? So I, in the, I, I actually yeah. saw you play at a student's union that I used to work at. Um, which I think would be sort of early noise, 
Yeah, uh, I remember you did a Supergrass cover, and I thoroughly enjoyed that. <laughs> um, I still, I still do that one sometimes. Oh, nice. Well, <laughs> so was that kind of period? Because it felt, again, you know, it felt like maybe when I watched you kind of up there, like I had a really good time and I remember mm-hmm. everyone really enjoying it. But it also felt a little bit like you were sort of trying to find your place a little bit. Oh, definitely. Yeah, you know I, what I mean? I was a bit lost at that point because I had just had, you know, um, maybe, as you say, 10 years in the wilderness, really. I, I, I didn't play the one and only or go out as me under my name for, for probably about 10 years, getting on for 10 years. I just kind of rebelled against it. I just thought, well, I'm not doing that anymore yeah. um, as me. You know, I formed bands. I just wanted to be in Radiohead. <laughs> that was <laughs> yeah. just like every other young musician at that time. Yeah. You know, I wanted to turn my guitar up to 11 and shoegaze. And and um, and that's kind of what I did. I, I just, uh, I formed bands. And, and, you know, my brother was with me all the way through. And we, we had different bands. And, and uh, I, I wrote and was a prolific writer through those, through those years. Yeah. And... Uh, uh, I went. I moved to New York, uh, played in crappy little venues, some great venues like CBGBs, and you know, played those those kind of iconic venues in New York. Uh, I did uh, did LA as well for for months on end, um, you know, and just basically playing where nobody knew who the hell I was, and and uh, you know, get your guitar amp blows up, and you get. And people like inter- introducing you with the wrong name and stuff like all that. I feel like I kind of paid my dues the wrong way round in a way. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, I did yeah. all the London sh- gigs as well. Like I, you know, all the kind of Camden Underworlds and all those little, you know. I did uh, not know. I, I did not know this. this yeah, thing. I did all that, and, and but it was not under me. I had different band na- uh, names, and people didn't know it was me. You know, I, I, I cut my hair. You know, I, was, I, I didn't even look the same really. Um, now and again, people would, like, would kind of recognise me and be like, "Are you Chesley Hawks?" You know, when when I'm playing in front of ten people or something at the Camden Underworld, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'd be like, "No, fuck off." <laughs> Was there a bit of a thing though, as well, where I guess if you've got that song, you know, because the thing with that song is, you know, we've we've almost talked about the sort of negative side of it, but it's also like you're never going to starve because you've got that song, right? There's always going to be a student union that wants to book you. There's always going to be... These aren't necessarily the things we dream of when we, like, want to be songwriters or fall in love with music or whatever. But it's that thing... I I did an episode the other day with Dave McCabe from the Zootons, and he's got a similar thing about Valerie, the song. Yeah. You know, he was like, for years, it felt like this kind of albatross, but it also, in a way, you know, I've never... I've never been able to... You know, I've never been short of opportunity because of it. It's just taken me, taken him a long time. Couldn't mm. work out whether I was talking the first or third person. That was confusing. <laughs> um, it, it, he was like, "Oh well, you know, as a songwriter, it's not what you aspire to because you want lots of big songs. You want lots of important of songs." But I, I wonder whether, the, I mean, what was the sort of deal with that? Like, you're kind of trying to make, <laughs> you're trying to do it almost. You're trying to kind of follow the art. And mm-hmm. you, you know, you you want to be in radio, Eddie, really playing the kind of indie scene in Camden, and such like. Is there something there where you're like, yeah, but I've got to make a living, and I've got this song, and it can it it can facilitate that. No, not not at first. Um, for that first ten years afterwards, I I I was like broke basically. I I, yeah. I was in the hole. I really was. Luckily, I met my wife in that time, and she was just like, you know, <laughs> helped me out with those things. Um, but no, I I kind of. I refused to play that song um, for all of that time. And it started just as you, what you were talking about, the student union stuff. And that that's what happened. I I, um, I got offered a student union gig. Uh, um, I think it was in Nottingham. Uh, and I was, it's was about 2001, just like turn of the century. And, and I was very nervous because I hadn't gone out as under my name for since those days i hadn't played that song and i just thought student union 10 years on they would have been nine when that came out i just there's no way that they're going to know who i am and uh, this is a disaster i was so nervous i remember i brought my my mate stewie with just two acoustic guitars and um it was a money thing you know i was like oh fuck it you know let's do it and i remember um being in the dressing room uh, at the stu- student union, there were three thousand people out there, and just before they were playing like um, you know house music. So, so through the, from the dressing room, all I heard was you know, 
this is going to be a disaster. <laughs> uh, you know, and I remember being really nervous, sweating and going on stage and I walked on stage and it was just like the most unbelievable reception, you know, pe for some reason uh, behind my back without me knowing, um, that song had become like a, a student anthem and a cult record, you know, yeah. had been handed down generations, I guess. And and uh, I had no idea that it was still popular and people and, and they were playing it, you know, at, at their student unions and stuff like that. So when I, when I walked on that stage and I saw these kids with my face on their T-shirt, you know, and like, <laughs> it's like, what? Yeah. Honestly, I was so shocked utterly shocked and and it was like a really good gig and of course when i played the one and only it tore the roof off i was like oh wow okay so then and then i never looked back from that i did i did those student unions for probably 10 years you know and, and then i bought i was like all right i need to bring the band in you know charge a bit more <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know and we and we had a we had an amazing uh time and through that through that time i was like okay so maybe i need to be thinking about putting a record out as me again you know and so right. all a lot of the songs that i'd written through that period through through the kind of like mid to late late 90s uh, and into the 2000s uh where i'd met you know Ad, uh, adam schlesinger from bounce away and i'd written with him i'd written with all these amazing people because that's one thing that i that kept me going was my songwriting and i and i really did you know i i had some incredible co-writes uh through that time and met some amazing uh, producer writers and and uh, you know artists. I was working with artists as well, um, so I had a, a catalog of songs that I thought was going to be uh, released under a band name that I ended up kind of like bringing into that uh, album, the another, another Fine Mess album. Okay, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've only, yeah, I've only. I mean, I'd be, I'd be totally honest like there was a period of that time where i did lose track of what you were doing but i was yeah. i did spend some time this weekend with like the five like the five disc release which is like there's not many artists that can say that they have no matter kind of how that your career perhaps then work out on the trajectory that you expected when you're younger there's not many people who uh, you know just just turning 50 can say oh i've actually got five five cds of my music that's quite amazing <laughs> well I mean, I would, if I was to look back, it's not a regret, but I, w I would have hoped, I think at 19, if you would ask me that, I would have been like, oh, definitely. I would, by then, I would have had like 10 albums. And, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah, <laughs> yeah. Just, yeah. I, I feel like I'm kind of a bit like Tears for Fears in that way. Like, you know, they make a record every every 12 years or something. But, <laughs> so what, but what about now, though? Like, yeah, because I guess, you know, I feel. I mean, like you say, you, you flit about with this. You, this might you might be complete. You might feel completely different about it when you get off this call or whatever. But mm. you know, right, right here and now, it feels like you've got this record of new songs, which definitely shows people a very run, a very vulnerable. Vulnerable is kind of the wrong word, but like a very kind of like real kind of portrayal of you. And I do think that if people you know, if you get the right press, if you get the right airplay, if people do listen to the record, then I think they will really see the honesty. Yeah, and and, and I think that really, I think that people love that stuff. Like people want to feel connections, right? And you have laid laid yourself bare. Um, so there's that, right? So there's that kind of the artistry of that, but also it does feel a little bit like you are more comfortable with the fact that you have this iconic song attached to your name and that, that feels like a good place to be and it also yeah. feels like within our culture right now you know we celebrate people like rick astley who i imagine has had similar uh thoughts perhaps that you have had like throughout your career where it's like this bloody song like <laughs> won't let me be anything else and yet he's like a national treasure now yeah is that how it feels, or am I kind of romanticizing it too much? Um, no, there's 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 truth to that. Um, I do, you know, now since those days when I started to kind of rediscover myself as an artist, um, I, I that my love for the for the song and the record um, has has grown, and you know, I mean, these days we're we we're definitely friends. You know, we we fell out a little bit and. Then start seeing each other again, 
and nowadays I, I can I can really appreciate you know what a great record it is um you know and it, it, I mean for for a, a songwriter musician uh, anyone that kind of you know tries to or thinks that they can just busk a song that song you can't yeah, it, it's, yeah. it's in four yeah. different keys I and mean, it's classic Nick Kershaw you know yeah. it's in four different keys uh it is not your average pop song you know yeah. it is yeah. it is a bit of a work of art actually musically um it's it's uh it's a complicated but I mean, it's such a difficult thing to do so you write something is so complicated like that with so many chords and different keys to make it sound like a pop banger is it's almost impossible to be honest with you so so i appreciate it for what it is um and i also more uh, i guess um what i'm trying to say is my what i what i like about it now as well is 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 the everybody that loves its connection to it you know oh, so right, more importantly yeah. Yeah. it's that you know yeah, and uh, yeah. you know what it means to to people out there the stuff that's nothing to do with me um you know over the years i've had so many um so many people say so many different things about it like i've had letters and and you know put messages on social media whatever just telling me stories uh about it like you know it was played at my student union when i met, first met my girlfriend who became my wife uh, it was played at my brother's funeral, you know, um, yeah. uh, it means so much to me because it got me through mental health issues because, you know, uh, made me realize that I, I am special because, you know, the lyric is very, uh, uh, you know, empowering that kind of self-empowering thing of the one and only it's, it's about, you know, I know I am the one and only, you know, all these incredible stories, um, from people that I don't know. So it's kind of like it went off and made these connections without me realizing it. And I'm, I went off and, and just ignored it for all those years. And, uh, it's just the power of music is incredible. Really, isn't it? What we do. And, and, you know, for a song like that to, to have all those connections. And now when I play it, I think about that and, and, you know, any time I play that song at any, any gig, it's a good gig. <laughs> it's just like, it's an incredible, thing to have up your sleeve just like oh if i'm having a bit of a dodgy gig it doesn't <laughs> yeah. happen but you know I, I just pull that one out of my sleeve and like it's a good gig suddenly you know <laughs> I've, I've always been interested to know what duncan jones's relationship is to that song because for a period oh. of time he just kept putting it in his movies well it, it i could tell you the whole story if you like James. do it yeah do it's it. a little bit of a long story but so first of all um his first film moon with sam rockwell uh, started to uh, become a, a cult classic. Actually, it was uh, like an early, early days cult underground cult classic, and uh, he used the one and only very cleverly uh, in the film. Where I don't, I don't want to spoil it for people, but basically, it's kind of like a, a bit of a Groundhog Day uh, idea. And uh, every day, he's woken up by his, uh, you know, clock radio, and the one and only is the song on it. So it's it's quite clever clever little uh, idea and uh i i became friends with him on twitter is <laughs> how oh, we met right, right, right. um because some of the fans of the film um started to kind of uh contact him and some and, and fans of mine or whatever saying that you should do you know things like silly th ideas like oh you should have like you know official merchandise of a clock radio already loaded with the one and only or that kind of silly stuff and we started kind of like commenting on it and then we became twitter buddies and we started direct messaging each other and uh he lived in L la i was here in in england at that point and i and i was going over there for a writing trip so i was i said hey let's meet up for a cup of coffee you know so we did we met up and fast friends turns out i knew his wife weirdly enough like just by pure coincidence, um, his then girlfriend. And then he said to me, look, okay, I've got this idea for the next film. I, because it went so well, I'm, I'm doing this film called Source Code with Jake Gyllenhaal. And uh, I want to use the one and only, but um, we can't afford what the what EMI want uh, for the for the sync license. So um, I was like, well, let's see how we can get around this. Uh, maybe, maybe we, well, I said, what do you actually need? What are you doing? 
and uh, he said, well, it's it's a ringtone and it's kind of a repeating ringtone. Very similar, funnily enough. It's, it was a repeating thing. Uh, if you haven't seen Source Code, I don't want to ruin it again, but kind of like a Groundhog Day thing. And um, it was Michelle Moynihan's ringtone. So I ended up recording just the beginning of the of the one and only uh, for him again so that oh, wow. he didn't have to pay the whole big thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I gave that to him. And it, and that was brilliant. So, and that went really well. And it's actually a big hit in the end of the film. And then his next film, because his, his last two films had done so well, he got um, he, he he took the reins of uh, World of Warcraft <laughs> of all films. And that one, he was he called me up. He's like, Ches, um, I want to use it again. And I, but the only thing is, this is kind of like a, a medieval kind of setting. Yeah. He said, "Can yeah. you play the loot?" I was like. No, I can't play the bloody lute. Oh, I was, I was going to say for a second, it's like I've, I, I totally forgot he'd made World of Warcraft or he made the Warcraft movie. I totally yeah. forgot. And I had I had watched that movie. Not his <laughs> greatest work. No. But for a moment, I was thinking, have I missed some kind of medieval version of the one and only? But Well, so uh, he's, he said to me, I want a version, of, a lute version, medieval v- bard version. And I was like, well, what do you have in mind? What? what you, I can't quite hear it, you know. So he said to me, you know, like, I am the one and only, nobody I'd rather be, something like that. So I said, what, so you mean the Pirates of Penzance then? Right. And uh, so I, I said, okay, I'll, I'll have a go. So I, I got a, f- a mate who played loot and and we did this medieval bard version of it. And and he's like, okay, this is so good um, that I want you in it. I want you in the film. So he flew me up to Toronto from L.A., and I spent uh, three days up there and and I played a medieval bard complete with a lute and, uh, you know, hats and everything else. And I was entertaining kids in the corner of this, like, amazing, like, uh, uh, you know, reconstruction of a, a medieval pub, uh, which took three days to film and I had to be there for the whole three days. And uh, it was an amazing experience, really great. Got to hang out with some of the, the actors and everything else. And then um, it turned out that uh, that scene got cut. It ended up on the cutting room floor. Right. Gutted. But it right. is in the uh, like DVD extras and specials. I think it's on YouTube as well. <laughs> I mean, I can't believe that you're going to make me buy the Warcraft DVD just to watch that. <laughs> That's, that is bonkers. That if, is you bonkers. Follow, if you follow Duncan on Twitter, Man Made Moon, um, he actually posted it on Twitter, the, the, the actual song on right, Twitter. Right. So a lot of people like talk to him on Twitter about it. But That's, from then that... on, it's been in every single one of his films. It was in Mute as well. Uh, it was oh, I, like didn't a... know, I didn't know that he'd kept going. Yeah, it's like a lucky rabbit's foot for him. I haven't heard from him for a while. I don't know what he's doing right now. But, uh, you know, I presume I'll get a call at some point. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. I love that. <clears throat> it's not on your Wikipedia page, by the way. The, the, your, no. war, your Warcraft appearance. Get that sorted. Yeah, I... I, I Wikipedia is a, a conundrum, isn't it? I, I I never know how it works. Yeah, I mean, you sort of just have to let other people get on with it, really. But it's yeah. uh, I do feel like that is an an omission that should be rectified. Yeah. T- tell me about working with Adam. What was Adam like? I mean, I'm a big Fountains of Wayne fan, but unfortunately, yeah. I never I never crossed paths. You know, um, yeah. it was a bit of a gap, really, given how much I love that band or lo- loved his songs. What was yeah. he like? Lovely, lovely man. Um, uh, I met him probably 96, 97, something like that, before Fountains of Wayne never made it, that's for sure. Right. I saw um, I saw him live, uh, saw them live at the Bowery Ballroom in New York. Um, and, you know, there was a good crowd there, but it, they hadn't even had a hit yet. So, And it was like Radiation Vibe and all those songs, you know, yeah. from their first yeah. record, which is just amazing. Anyone who hasn't heard those original um, Bounds of Wayne albums is so good. Uh, and fell in love with them. And, uh, you know, got to meet him and everything backstage. And and uh, and uh, I was going to be uh, making a making a, a record or I was writing songs anyway. And uh, we decided to write together. Lovely man. Um, he was very, uh, very encouraging as well. Like he... he when we wrote, we wrote a couple of songs and when we were recording them in his, he was actually in his bedroom, I think. And, uh, he had this little, um, back then it was like the ADATs, you know, and, oh, right, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
And uh, he made me, because he's a better guitar player than me, but he made me play the solo. You know, he's like, no, this is your record. You should do it. And, uh, you know, he was in, very encouraging in that way. And we stayed in contact, uh, you know, for, for for the whole the whole time. Um, you know, that one of those songs actually, uh, Stay Away Baby Jane, made it into, um, uh, onto my Another Fine Mess album. Yeah. I, lo- I, I mean, I love your vocal on that record. I think it's amazing. Like, it's... It, you almost have to do a bit of a double take of is it you but i just <laughs> yeah. think that you're this is what i was trying to say about that power pop thing is that mm. i feel like for him like knowing about the things that inspired him or his tastes it he must have been aware of one and only like it, that he must have considered that a classic power pop record well i mean he... Yeah, I think with Adam, but because he's American, like it, it was a top ten record in in the states, but it wasn't in the same kind of league as it is over here. Um, yeah, it doesn't yeah. have the same uh, ju- uh, you know journey. Um, so I can't remember. Uh, I mean, we just bonded over music, and you know, we've, it, it, we just got on. You know, and I I can't even remember talking about my past and stuff like that with him. It's weird, but but maybe it, it's possible. Um, I think we did talk about Nick, actually. Yeah, I imagine um, he would be impressed by that. Yeah, I think he was a Nick fan. Um, he he liked. Um, yeah, if I remember rightly, he, we we talked about wouldn't it be good in his early days. Um, but yeah, he was he was a great guy. Um, I ended up doing uh, years later. Um, just 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 when I moved to the states, about two thousand sorry two thousand thirteen something like that. Um, he came over to LA and. Uh, and I, I did the, um, uh, who's the, uh, God, the, the, the talk show host with the red hair, uh, Conan O'Brien. Oh, right. I did the Conan O'Brien show um, with Fountains of Wayne um, and uh, Harry Shearer. <laughs> <laughs> what? I'm about to, I feel like you're giving me so many things I need to find on YouTube after. Do you know what? I've looked for that. And I can't find it's not on YouTube, or at least I can't find it. And I, I would, if you do find that, I would love to see it because it uh, that was a moment. That was like it was Harry Shearer did this song called um, Celebrity Booze Endorser. <laughs> Listen, I, I have had a nightmare with YouTube the last week, and I'm just using this as an opportunity to commit this story to the podcast, right? It's very, <laughs> it's very kind of tangential and you may or may not be interested, but I feel like I need to share it with, with it. people who listen to the podcast. So the other day, me and my wife, we were talking about, uh, so I took my mum to see, like on Friday, I took my mum to see Marty Pello. Yeah. Good, a good time was had. You know, not really my thing. Sorry, Marty. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, it was a real treat seeing my mum have a good time. And we got talking a bit about, you know, those songs that lived at the top of the charts that were on top of the pops every week. And that led us to Brian Adams. It led us to everything I do. And my wife was telling me that when she was a kid and she went to see Robin Hood, she was so obsessed with that song that her mum had to sit her down and say, listen, you know, it's a film. Like, they're not just playing the song. Like, there's a story as well. And then we got <laughs> talking. We wanted to watch the video on YouTube. And we couldn't find the video that had the um, clips from the movie interspersed. We could just find, like, a performance video, like, like a Brian Adams yeah, video yeah, where he's yeah. playing to the extent that we thought we were going mental, like had we imagined that there was this video that was interspersed with footage of Kevin Costner and Christian Slater and stuff. And then we found, you know, it's that Mandela effect thing, you know, where people talk about the Mandela effect where yeah. everyone yeah, remembers something that maybe didn't happen, you know. And because uh, it's not on YouTube, the video that's got Kevin Costner in isn't, and the, the burning arrow and all that, it's not on YouTube. And we were like, mm. are we, have we? <laughs> And then eventually, a friend of us, a friend of ours, did track it down, not on YouTube, on some other video streaming site. Yeah. But uh, I don't really know why I started this story. But <laughs> I am pleased that I've got it on tape. And I need to tell you something. Um, there's a writer called Anna Doble, who has got a book coming out really soon called "Connection Is a Song." She was a guest on the podcast recently, and there is a massive section of her. Uh, there's a massive section of her her new book that is about you and about her teenage fandom of you. Um, it's like it's amazing. Like there's no way you won't read it without grinning your head off because it's not that thing of oh Chesney Hawks, you know, teen heartthrob. It's that thing of 
I got into Chesney Hawks. I thought he was a genius. Um, it, you'll really like it. And I actually, the other day, I told the publisher, I gave your manager's email to him. So I think you should get a copy because I think it'll make you feel really good. Oh, that's amazing. I, I can't wait to read that. Yeah, yeah. look yeah. her up on Twitter as well. It would be, it would be amazing if you find her on Twitter. Cause I oh, I will. She, I, I will. I, Anna Doble. I'll, I'll check it out. Yeah, I told her the other day, I said, oh, I'm speaking to Chesney for the podcast. And she <laughs> she was having a good, you know, she was freaking out. She was like, can you tell him about the book, please? So, <laughs> Oh, that's so great. I'll definitely get a copy of that. So you've told J- uh, James, my manager, about it, have you? Yeah, yeah. I, I, no, I think it was the other way around. I think I told the the publisher. It's on Nine Eight Books, which is this really cool uh, music book in print, which is putting out you know essential music books at the rate of about three a month at the moment. It's kind of hard to read yeah, anything else other than those books. But I think it's going to be a big deal this book. So, and yet, like I say, you have a bit of a starring role in it. And I think yeah. she actually maybe, I think she maybe interviewed you actually when she was like a student journalist. I can't. Can't say whether I'm totally right about that, but I'm pretty sure there's a bit in it where she talks about having met you kind of years on and stuff. She works for the BBC now, for the World Service, so it's nice to see her kind of doing so well. I'll go and hunt her down and send her a a direct Twitter message or something. (laughs) Yeah, do it, do it. I I better go get ready for the football, uh, which is a shame because I feel like I could talk to you all day and and (laughs) inevitably when I get off this... Uh, when I get off this Zoom, um, I'll think of about twenty more things I want to ask you. But yeah. what, what's the plan now then with the this record that I've heard that no one else has, which is kind of blow my mind really? Uh, <laughs> when when will other people be able to hear it? Well, I'm hoping this year um, is when the record comes out. It's kind of been put back and back. COVID, and, you know, didn't help um, with that. But um, it's it's funny because i've got a new team new everything you know it's all going really well for me and uh my manager's like we need to if we're going to put this out we can't just put it out we have to make sure that people hear this record uh and you know i agree um we can't just do it half half assed you know willy-nilly so so i'm planning my plan is to put it out as soon as possible um, but it's all about strategic planning and all that kind of stuff. So I think uh, if I had, to, if I was a betting man, <laughs> I think it, I would. It would be kind of like uh, late summer for the album, and I'm hoping we can put maybe a couple of of the songs out um, beforehand as teasers or singles. Uh, do people do singles now? I don't even know these days. Well, they <laughs> they they do. I don't really understand why they do, but they do. Yeah. Um. My my wife. My my. my my wife is a music manager, so she's always talking right. about there's a song coming out on this day and such like. And I'm always like, why? <laughs> but you know, yeah. apparently it works. You know. So. Yeah, I think it's like a teaser, isn't it? For for yeah, when you dump, when you dump the whole thing, is it? I miss those days of putting a, a record out. You know. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> like you can say what you want about teasers, but that that those teasers aren't number one in the charts for five weeks, Chesney. You know what I mean? No, 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 exactly, mate. Exactly, exactly. exactly. <laughs> um. Listen, maybe when the record's out, we should do a part two and we can go a bit deeper yeah. into the record because there is there were, there were some other things I was going to ask you, but yeah. I felt like we, uh, I felt like I was so flawed when I heard that song 13 um, mm-hmm. that I just felt like asking you some other tidbits yeah. about the rest of the record was a bit inconsequential, really. But <laughs> sure, um, sure. I think it's, I think it's really, I think it's really going to make some people sit up and pay notice if they if they can get to it do you know what i mean that's if, the thing like, is it's getting it to them isn't it you know you're what you'll know uh, being married to a music manager that that's that's the uh the ticket isn't it yeah absolutely uh... also that said i mean you've been on this podcast now so the, the only way is up um <laughs> yeah that, that said i did do an april fools today and said that um said that Taylor Swift was on the podcast and I've just had loads of people complaining to me all morning that Taylor Swift isn't on the podcast. So, you know, maybe <laughs> I know. That, that's that's the worst introduction. Isn't it? We, we all thought you were getting Taylor Swift. We don't have Taylor Swift, but guess what? We've got Chesney <laughs> well, Fox. <laughs> th- th- this, this is going to be this episode will be in a few days time. So I mean, the disappointment would have faded. But again, man, one, one and only Taylor doesn't have that in her repertoire. <laughs> Um, got plenty of others though. <laughs> no, she's not short on the hits. No, she? she's not short on hits. I, I tell you, uh, Chesney, this has been a real treat. I hope it's been all right for you. I... Oh, it's been really lovely, mate. It really has, and and I'm totally up for doing part two. Um, you know, in a couple of months or something, if you're up for that. That sounds brilliant. Okay, I'm going to go watch Late and I Ain't Lose now. 
Take care of yourself, and I'll speak to you again. Tell tell them all that you were just hanging out with a West Ham fan. Big time. All right, man. Take care. <laughs> See you, dude. Thanks, Bye. James. Cheers.